Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and I'm continuing um, along the theme from my previous video um, to discuss the global food supply and how rapidly accelerating abrupt climate system change is posing severe risks to our global food supply. It's happening right now. And I basically outlined 10 sort of primary effects of climate change on the food supply and also 10 secondary effects. And this was in the last video, but now I'm gonna go over the details um, of actually what is happening around the world with our global food supply um, and how, you know, it's really being, starting to be hammered by abrupt climate change. So this is my website, paulbeckwith.net. So please check it out if you haven't um, before and uh, consider donating to my PayPal account to support my research and videos. This is my YouTube channel. So I usually upload multiple videos um, during a week and you, there's a search function here in YouTube. So I've got just about every topic of climate change covered and uh, in the near future I'll be talking a lot about some of the most promising solutions. Um, just to give you a heads up on that, there's things like um, the, uh, okay, where are we here? Up here. Okay, these guys here. So iron salt aerosols, um, the, the uh, Restore Our Climate uh, website on iron salt aerosol how it safely removes atmospheric methane and does lots of other things um, i'll be talking about uh, so more uh, in stuff on restoring our climate um, and uh, some of the technical details of iron salt aerosols and you know lots of other lots of other fun stuff direct mineralization of atmospheric co2 using natural rocks in japan I'll talk about sunshades up in space and uh, all kinds of other other different other things. But getting back to food, okay. Uh, well, first of all, I, I have you know this is my Facebook page. Um, just find it, Paul Beckwith. You know, please follow me. Um, I've made some room. If you're not following me, or send me a message, say you, you watch my videos and you'd like to subscribe because I'm up near the near the limit that Facebook puts on that page. But I also have a Facebook group, which is open to everybody. And then, of course, Twitter. Um, you know, very, I post loads of stuff on, on Twitter. But I want to talk about uh, this list, uh, a set of threads that Jim Baird has put together. So specifically, he's put together a thread on current climate change impacts on food security. So this is on food security, uh, but it doesn't consider the oceans. Uh, so I'll, t I'll talk about the oceans in, in later threads. So if you delve down into the details of this, the, these are the primary, there, there, there's at least 10 ways. There's, there's more than that, but there's 10 ways that I'll discuss here. So heat stress is reducing crop yields. Heat stress is having tremendous impacts on farmers, sometimes fatal. So, you know, reducing the hours that they can work, reducing their productivity, et cetera. Heat stress is, is uh, often fatal and, and negatively impacting livestock. So, it's, you know, there's lots of livestock uh, mass fatalities from, from the heat stress. Um, there's, it's affecting the precipitation. It's altering precipitation patterns. In many cases, there's not enough rain, so we get droughts wiping out crops. In other cases, there's too much rain, so we get flooding, you know, also wiping out crops. Now, both of these things, these uh, between drought and flooding, are being intensified by stalled weather patterns, by blocking of the jet streams, and these, they're also occurring on larger scales, okay? So we can, like the chilly mega drought, monsoon disruptions, Okay, the stalled weather patterns are covering larger areas uh, under the stalling, um, therefore impacting more and more crops. Increasing, we're also, we're, increasingly, we're also seeing a pattern of whiplash between drought flooding, drought flooding, often year to year. For example, 
you know, uh, and you and that's reflected in, for example, the levels of the Mississippi River. It can be at record maximum levels one year, record minimum next year, back to maximum, and so on. This this whiplashing, back and forth. Also, whiplashing from, you know, on a on a on a uh, finer scale. For example, you know, a few days super warm, then a few days super cold, a few days super warm. You know, and that's that that wreaks havoc on on crops. The extreme weather is also physically damaging crops. So we can have late frosts, early snowfalls, early warm weather, confusing plants and resulting in damage to plants that budded prematurely, for example, or, and also hail events, which destroy lots of crops. Also, wildfire is physically destroying crops and livestock. And the smoke and other pollutants from the wildfire is damaging crops that are even hundreds of kilometers away from the Fire, for example, smoke damage to grapes, um, making wine taste terrible and destroying wine crops of wineries for, for the season. The extreme weather is also damaging and disrupting food transportation, uh, ports and rail, uh, storage infrastructure, grain elevators, and also the cold chain to keep food preserved as it's transported to, to market. All of these effects are already cascading into a variety of secondary effects. So crop and farm failures, financing challenges, migrations, um, and farmer suicide, okay? And also uh, general strikes, farmers striking. Uh, you know, just last week in India, a record size strike, 200 million people, including many farmers, striking. This is, uh, th these things are leading in turn to a loss of agricultural labor and to resource conflict. It's stressing, you know, when crops are stressed, it stresses the seeds. When the seeds are stressed, that results in poor crops in subsequent years. Drought and sea level rise is causing salinization of the soil, so it's less fertile. It's, it, it, and it can be poisonous to some um, plants and crops. They just can't grow if the, if, with salinization of the soil. <clears throat> Heat, drought, and overuse of pesticides. You know, it's wiping out the bees, the butterflies, and other pollinators. Changing precipitation patterns. It can improve the breeding of locusts and other pests, so they become a bigger problem. Drought, of course, leads to soil loss and desertification of regions. Drought also decreases the uh, number of glaciers and the groundwater infiltration, and that amplifies the water stress in subsequent years. Of course, flooding, too much water carrying over into another growing season, um, and crop loss, of course. It impacts food prices and feed prices. It impacts the feed prices the following year. Okay, and there's many, many other ones that, 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 that we'll discuss. So let's look at some of the actual um, details here. So Canada could be a huge climate change winner when it comes to farmland. Okay, uh, but the problem is, is converting new land to farming could generate huge emissions and harm biodiversity. Okay, you can just Google if, you know, if there's specific titles that you want to delve into deeper than I'm covering, just uh, Google the, the title. Okay, but, uh, you know, this is a study. Uh, it's, Canada will add a huge share of the land that becomes climatically suitable for growing major crops as the world temperatures continue to rise. Also, Russia. Okay, um, Canada may become the breadbasket basket of the planet for the future. Okay, currently only one million, only about a million square kilometers of Canada are warm enough for growing crops like wheat, corn, and potatoes. But by 2080, uh, you can add 4.2 million square kilometers to that. Those, that. those regions are currently too cold for farming crops like wheat, and they'll be warm enough by 2080. But it depends on the soils, okay? The soils are not developed and they're thin and it, this is in rocky parts of the Canadian Shield. So we'll get nowhere near that amount of viable land and it will take many, many years for the, you know, once you start growing some crops to build up the soils. You know, a lot of the Canadian Shield is, the boreal forest is coniferous 
trees and those trees of course they don't have leaves to fall and to generate uh, leaf litter and the decomposition then would build up soil. So the soils are very thin and they're acidic and it's very rocky region so so um, you know although the climate will be conducive to growing food but you know in this study um, it doesn't really consider the soils. So these are some areas where you know if you look at the 12 major crops of the world about 30 percent of the land that's currently being farmed will uh, you know you'll be, have an increase in farm land by about 30 percent that's 15.1 million square kilometers of new land that's around the planet 4.2 of that is in Canada which is a huge chunk of course um, and these are some of the regions uh, where the suitability, uh, you know, the blue areas are regions that where the climate will allow the suitability to start growing some crops. Um, and uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the blue, the, and, and so, so basically uh, the blue areas are areas that transition from no current suitability for major commodity crops to suitability for one or more crops are in blue. Currently uncultivated areas that transition to suitability for multiple major commodity crops are shown in red. Okay, so those are regions where the climate will become conducive to growing more food, but then it all depends on the soils. So you need to have a conducive climate to growing things and then build up the soils. And, and that's not considered in this study, right? So um, that's not going to, uh, you know, this is helpful, but it's going to take time to start growing crops in these areas and then having the infrastructure to transport the crops to market, etc. Okay, so so this is the original paper here that this is in. You know, the you can go to the uh, the scientific paper, the peer-reviewed paper, and look at the environmental consequences of climate-driven agricultural frontiers, you know, and it does talk about the soils and the emissions that will come from developing those those regions. Okay, high temperatures, heat stress, it reduces yields of crops. So this is an article where it's talking about uh, parts of India um, where high temperatures reduce the rice and sorghum yields. And we're talking about days uh, when the temperature is above 33 degrees Celsius, then these, the, the yields of these crops is severely impacted. Okay, so this is a study on you know, how the effects of high temperatures. Uh, a in the case of rice, for example, a percent increase in, in the uh, EDD is extreme degree days. Above 33 degrees Celsius, it decreases rice yields by 5%. Okay, so that's for every percent increase. So it's very, very sensitive. The yield is very, very sensitive to temperature once you get over that threshold value. And they looked at other diff other crops as well to see how they would be affected. India heat wave temperatures past 50 degrees Celsius. Okay, of course, you know that uh, you know that's unrelenting. That that causes water shortages, heat stroke, and also, you know, really destroys the the crops that are growing in in those particular regions. You can't grow stuff. Chile, you know, drought it's killed thousands of farm animals. Okay. You know, the family farm in Chile, the dead animals, the drought, that's the worst thing for the farmers, the drought, you know, losing cattle. 106,000 animals died due to lack of water and fodder, goats, cattle, and sheep. Okay, um, so this is, you know, lots of different places where, where this is happening. Thousands of chickens baked to death in a heat wave. This was in, I believe, in the UK. Okay, and uh, we can look here, climate change, how it's affecting local dairy farms and the milk production is, you know, when an animal is stressed, it's not producing as much milk and uh, it's not, you know, when it's, it's not, it doesn't have enough to eat and, uh, you know, the meat in it, so the livestock, you know, in all, that, it, it, all, all aspects as far as the food production is negatively affected by the, these uh, heat waves. Farmers hit hard by changing rainfall pattern in Bihar, okay? This less than normal rainfall in the past seven years. Okay, um, okay, and this is again in, in India. 
okay, the monsoon uh, being threatened. So thank you for listening, and I'll continue on in uh, one more video. Thanks again.